4D Mobile, this product, is the solution for you to make mobile applications with 4D. Mobile is actually getting kind of important. We are in a really fantastic time where we have a lot of opportunities to develop mobile applications. There are a lot of screens out there, and um, they're growing quickly. You can see here's a, here's a chart in the US on growth for, 40 for I'm sorry, mobile tablets and uh, mobile device phones, and the growth rate is kind of staggering. More and more people are buying them. And when you look at the mobile statistics, it's kind of overwhelming. People are using them a lot. It's possible that they're replacing television. They are less time on the desktops now with mobile devices. Another, they're using them all over the place, right? Social networking and gaming and email and movies and shopping and the list goes on and on. And they're using them all the time on the weekends, on the weekdays, at night, in the mornings. And when you really go through this list, especially if you're listening to me in French, you understand that it's overwhelming. But we have a little trick here. We can take a breath and just relax for a moment. Because as business application developers, not all that stuff matters. Only a few key things matter that I want to focus on. First off, did you notice the statistic that said that 80%, over 80% of that usage of the mobile device is at home, a person's home? That's important to us. So hold on to it for just a second. Another statistic that I wanted to highlight was that of all the things people are doing, the social networking, the emails, the watching movies, all of those things, a full 20% is done, is, is other, something else. That's the space that we want to focus on, we want to think about. So with these two things, the 80% at home, all this other stuff, plus a little tiny bit, 20% is something else, our opportunity. The question I have, since it's mostly at home, they're using these devices, whose device is it, right? Whose mobile device is it really? And when you look at this in deployment and thinking about it from a business perspective, it becomes very clear that the device is a personal device. Each person brings their own device. You bring your own device to the work and you use it. And that's kind of a problem because new things arise because of this. So it's important for us to understand that the users decide what the device is. I decided this is going to be the thing I use for work here. We call that bring your own device. We'll sum it up with this little image, be, bring your own device. And we'll hold on to that for a moment. Now. Mobile devices travel, of course. And because of their ability to travel so easily, there's some security implementation, and there's some security issues that arise specifically because they are traveling around. Actually, this tablet's a great example of that. When we were in Las Vegas, other people had the same Nexus 7. And at the end of a long day of practicing and talking and all that, I went back to review my notes and I turned the screen on and it wasn't my tablet, it was somebody else's. So because of that, it's not really that people are you know, stealing them, which they are, it's loss, it's forgetting, it's, oh, I think it's at the office, and then you get to the office, oh, I think it's at home, it's hard to keep track of them. There are real security problems because of that. Let's hold on to that idea for a moment. Application updates operate very differently in this mobile space, right? It used to be that the business software was on a desktop computer at the office, and early in the morning or late on a weekend or something, an IT professional would update the operating system, update new software, things of that nature. You'd go into the clients when they're on a vacation day and f update. But because the device is mobile, you can't do it that way. You, you can't, unless I make the mistake, you can't take this from me. I need it all the time. So, it's not possible to grab it and install stuff on it. So because of that, we have a problem. And the solution 
is, is relatively simple. We push applications to these devices, right? We deploy to each device. Doing that's kind of tricky. And so we need to hold on to that idea for a minute, too. So with these three core areas, I want to talk about your options and what we're suggesting. To make mobile applications, you can have a compiled application that you put on the phone through one of these deploying app features where you compile the application, or you can make a web application where the actual client is a browser that comes with the device, Chrome, Safari, things of that nature. So let's talk first about the native application. This is a compiled application. And what issues arise when you try to build a native application? Well, the first off, keep in mind that the devices your clients have, your users have, they brought them themselves, right? Bring your own device. So what devices do you have to build for? Well, a lot. And that's a problem. Because as awesome as all of you are at 4D development, you have to get that good at all of those languages to really make applications work in a compiled environment, right? You have to learn C Sharp and deploy there. That's a lot of learning. And in fact, what people do is they hire expertise, thinning out your income, basically. It's a problem. The next thing I want to talk about is actually taking that application and putting it on the device. I talked about deployment. Well, since it's a bring your own device, you have three different places to deploy. These are three different businesses, right? I'll just talk about Apple, for example. The App Store is a massively successful business for Apple. They make a lot of money. They take 20 or 30% off the top. And they really, really want successful applications on their store. And successful applications for Apple is a million plus users. That's not a business application. And so unfortunately, they don't care about your 300 users. So when you want to do something with them, they don't listen to you. But you have to, to put something on an iPad native, you have to talk to them. That's a really bad business relationship for you, right? And I'm not even going to talk about the other two places. All of these things have, a, have an issue for you. You don't control when you deploy. So let's talk about the security. Let's say. I swap tablets with someone, and I open it up, and I see, oh, there's an application I've never seen before. How does it work? Well, that's, excuse me, that's kind of a problem, because that application that's left running has sensitive user information. Your client's data could be in that app. Even if the app isn't running, it might be running in the background. Even if it's not running in the background, the way a native app works is you have local storage, which you then sync. So you have to design very cleverly to make sure that data is not on the device. Also, it's their device, the user's device. So they might turn off the unlock keypad. So it's really tricky to make sure your client data is not in the wrong person's hands when you put an application in a device that they lose. <laughs> All right, one other thing about deployment, and that is that when the operating system update happens, it's not your decision when to update, right? Their OS, let's say um, Apple releases a new operating system for the tablets and iPhones, they'll push it out to some people, some people will get it, but basically when this happens, you have a serious problem because your application quite likely will break. So Janet's on the old operating system, Frank's on the new operating system, and Frank's app doesn't work. So then you try to fix it hurriedly, because it happened without you expecting. As you fix it, you then try to deploy it, and Apple says, uh, I'll talk to you in a few weeks. And Frank can't work. And you didn't have any control over that process. So it's a real serious issue as well. So, Thinking about all these spaces, the obvious question is, does it make sense to build a native app? And so I'm going to ask all of you to respond with no or 
nine what, in German. But basically, answer no to this question. Should we build a native application? No, no we should not. So let's look at the same. <laughs> I love forcing an audience. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's look at the same issues with the web application space, right? So this is a browser app, an app that runs right in the web browser. All right. Um, bring your own device. All these devices. I saw that giant, scary tablet list, and there's more coming out all the time. So what do you have to learn to build web applications? Well, you have to learn something, right? You have to learn HTML. CSS, and JavaScript. Three languages, kind of, that are bound together. But that solves all of the spaces when you're dealing with a web application, right? There are differences in the screen size and so on, but the actual environment that you're learning and developing in is one environment. That's very beneficial to you as a developer. So. You make your application, it starts to work, you test it a bit, it's time to deploy. What's really cool about web applications is you can choose a lot of places to put your application. You can run it in the client's local network, you can run it from your office if you'd like, you can find some company that will host it, um, or even a local ISP, a local internet service provider um, down the street. You can put a rack in there and have an, a machine there. So you decide all of that, which means you have flexibility. You don't have to work with Apple. You can do it yourself. That feels better because you now no longer have a business partner that you know takes a little all the time and doesn't give you much. Web applications um, rely on a relatively smart client the browser, and it's getting better and smarter all the time. And one of the core concepts is a stateless environment. This means that as you interact with the application, there's one thing you keep track of, and that is a session on the browser. And as you get data from the server, it's bound to that session. When the session expires, which it does, inherently that's how web browsers work, there's no more relationship to the server anymore. You have to reestablish. And the data, generally, is only available during that session. So the data of your user is not really on the device in a persistent way. So when you lose the device, an hour later someone starts it up, there's nothing there for them to get. They have to log in. And you can force the login, right? They can't keep the app running. The login state is something you manage. So that's nice, because the data is not left around stored on a device that can be looked at. So the last thing I want to talk about has to do with backwards compatibility. And this is a big topic for me. One of the things I do for 4D is I sit on the World Wide Web Consortium. This is the W3C. It is a large standards body for the web. And I sit in a group called the Web Apps Group. And this is the browser companies and 4D and others involved and interested in the cutting edge technology that will be added to the web. Uh, things like sockets and things of that nature. The enhancements we see all the time. And when I sit in a meeting with Apple talking about Safari and Google talking about Chrome and Mozilla talking about Firefox, and yes, Microsoft's there and they're very involved in the standards, all of them are saying, well, we like what we did here, and they argue and decide on which one gets a blessing, a standard. But one of the core features that all of them understand of the web is that it is massive. It is so massive, that the idea of updating the web, the individual documents, is impossible. And therefore, you have to be backwards compatible. And there's a mantra that all of these people have, and that is, you cannot break the web. So when one of them says, wouldn't it be cool if we had multi-threaded capabilities in a browser, they figure out how to do it without breaking backwards compatibility. And that is a core belief in the people that define the standards and make the browsers. So it's very backwards compatible. 
which is fantastic for application developers, because when you make an application, three years later, that web application will still work. That is amazing, and only available in the web environment. So when I say, should we make a web application? Yes, we should. And the solution we have for you is 4D Mobile. Now, 4D Mobile is two things, really. It's, well, three things. It's 4D14, OK? And it is Wakanda Enterprise and a connector for 4D. And I'll leave that at that for now, but basically it allows 4D14 and Wakanda to talk to each other. And I'll show you a little bit more in that bit. So let me talk about Wakanda. Wakanda is very similar to 4D, um, but it is focused around web technologies. So it has a development tool, a deployment server, a server for actually running your applications, a client runtime. Now, what this is is the JavaScript stack that makes it easier to develop web applications. And it also is an administrative tool and a monitoring tool and deals with backups and things of that nature. So it's all of those things. So Wakanda Studio has a database modeling tool, just like 4D. It has a remote and local debugger. So debuggers are built into it. Deals with permission management. And it's a graphical user interface. You make forms in, in um, 4D. You make web pages in Wakanda. The tools have a lot of similarities. So the server, Wakanda DB, is the database engine that you all know, but a little different. It is, um, has a web server built into it, too. And they're kind of bound together in a really elegant way. And I'll move on a bit. The client framework, building web applications, if any of you built web applications, you know that the browser environment is a little tricky. We've seen tools that made it easier, debuggers and things like that, web inspectors, which you now have in, in 4D. We have a really great layer in the, in the client, in the browser, that makes it feel like, well, it kind of makes it feel like when you're developing in a 4D client and you're accessing the server. It has that similarity where things are just handled for you. I won't go into more detail there. I, I am trying to step through quickly. And the last piece is just data administration, right? The server admin. And we run the administration tool through a web browser. So you can stop and start the, web server, the, the projects you run. You can download. You can view the data. All the tools you'd expect in an administrative tool is in the browser for you, which is kind of nice. So that's Wakanda. Now, Wakanda has one technology stack. because We feel strongly that having less to learn is a good thing. So with all of this, you're actually using JavaScript, all the language in there, and then HTML and CSS, the language of the web. So that's the Wakanda project product. And let me show you how you connect it to 4D. So. <clears throat> Is it two? Yeah, yeah. OK. So this is 4D. I'm assuming you all know this better than I do. And we're just looking at the structure of a very simple database, companies and contacts. And what I want to show you here is that I have a relationship. I've named the relationship. So let me just take a look at what, what we've named this relationship. Am I frozen? I am. This is what happens when you put things stack to stack. Anybody ever done this? Josh, you want to come up and dance for everybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm actually running um, this project on 4D server, so I'll go ahead and open it. Was that the wrong one, Ad? Do you see that? <laughs> stop, stop, stop. All 
All right, I got to force quit it again. You know what I need is a 4D expert. So I'm running 4D server locally and connecting to it. And I want to show you this relationship. All right. The point is that this relationship that I've got between these two fields, I've named a very specific way for Wakanda to understand them. So if I zoom in on the one-to-many relationships, this is from the companies table looking to contacts. We've named it contacts. Okay. And for the many to one inside the contacts data uh, table, we've named the relationship company. Okay. Now, before I can actually connect Wakanda to this system, I actually have to turn on something or do something. I don't know. So I'm going to ask a 4D expert to help me. Josh, would you come up? And I'm an out? I'm an expert, right? Yes. So, what are the steps that we need to do yes. to make 4D prepared to? be accessed by Wakanda. OK, I'm going to switch to your server. I'm going to open up your database settings, the web tab. There's a new tab over here that says REST. Uh, Can I turn that on? OK, that makes sense. So this is the REST server that Wakanda uses. That to Wakanda connect. talks uh -huh. to. So Wakanda REST server. And okay. then the next step is I walk off stage. That's, <laughs> that's literally all you have to do. That's all you have to do. All right, cool. So for this migrated database that was a 40 database in an earlier version, moved to 4014, that's all you have to do. So now in Wakanda, let's see what we have to do in Wakanda to tell Wakanda how to connect to it. So I'm going to create a new solution. We'll call this um, 40 Summit EU. OK. So this creates a web application, a Wakanda application for us. And we do have a data modeler inside 4D. I'm sorry, Wakanda. Here's the data modeler. I can make a new table if I want. I'll call this local because we'll see it a bit. So that could be a local table. In Wakanda, we name it something else. We'll go into that some other time. But I can also attach a 4D database, which is what I want to do. right? I don't want to recreate my data structure in Wakanda. I want to use my existing application in 4D. So I'm just going to paste in one line of code. But let's take a look at what this code does. Okay? I'll go ahead and make it pretty and have some, <coughs> carriage, some line returns so we can see it. So this has the model object, which is our data engine in Wakanda. And then we have merge outside catalog. We're naming that remote 4D. See that top line? The next line, I'm saying, how do you get to 4D, the application space? I'm using a local IP address because it's running on this machine. And I'm running the web server, the, the 4D web server, on port 9017. And I'm, I'm using a designer user because I want to have all rights right now because I'm kind of in the early stages. All right. So we'll save that. And when I save that, it didn't add the models here, right? Because this is our local data engine. Instead, it actually gave us another file over here, which actually has two tables in it companies and contacts. And that is the 4D database, right? That's a representation of the 4D database. So I had to get a 4D expert to click the box. And then, which of course I could have done myself. And then I had to write one line of code. And I have Wakanda seeing, Wakanda Studio seeing 4D. <laughs> Notice that companies has all the fields we had in 4D except it has one extra at the bottom called contacts. That was the relationship name, right? So it used the name to make an attribute. And in fact, we're going to use that attribute to have auto relationships. Okay? They're, kind of, they're part of the data structure, if you will. A little different than 4D. All right, so now what can we do with this? Well, we'll go open a web page. And I'm just going to ex expand that out a bit. This is an HTML page. Okay? That's all it is and it has nothing in it. So let's add some stuff to it. You'll notice that over here on the side, I've got data store classes. Those are what Wakanda call tables. Those are tables, OK? 
Different language, but it's the same type of thing. So there's the local one, and here are the two ones that came from 4D. From Wakanda's perspective, there's nothing different. One happens to be a 4D database, but Wakanda works the same way, which is nice. So I'm going to expand out companies and take the company field, or in Wakanda, we'd call it an attribute, which is actually the name of the company. I'm just going to drag it out to the HTML space and drop it. This is a little tool that allows you to make widgets. Basically, widgets are form objects, but in Wakanda, widgets. Okay? And I'm going to choose a grid form object, but it's called a widget here. And I'm just going to say create. Now, what that actually did is it generated HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to make that work. Okay? So it's doing that stuff for you a lot. So now I'm just going to save this page, and I'm going to say run. Now, when I actually run this page, it starts up the, Ford, the Wakanda database, Wakanda DB. When Wakanda DB starts up, yes, yes, yes. When Wakanda DB starts up, connects to the 4D server, and we are golden. Let's see what it does. So here's a web page. There it is. There's the 4D data. OK? It was that easy. Additionally, this widget allows you to scroll through multiple records. I mean, we have 14,000, over 14,000 companies in the 4D database. All of the handshaking between the client to the Wakanda server to, Wakanda, to 4D and back up all works out of the box. And I've put one line of code in the application. You can applaud if you'd like. But there's more. Remember I said that there's this idea of relations built in? We call those related attributes. So I'm going to create in, so I'll, I'll create inside this page a related attribute, which will give me a table reference. Okay? So I'll expand out and add this, this companies is the companies I've already dropped onto the page. Okay? So it's already there. So I'm going to use the relation that we talked about earlier called contacts of companies to get access to the data in contacts. So now, because I've, I'm adding this to the page, that space is all bound through the relationship simply. So I'll say, I'll add that. And here it is. Here's that table. And I'll just take, I don't know, first name, last name, phone number, and I'll drop, drag these out to the play field, to the application. I'll use a grid again and say, create. We'll expand this out so we can see the phone numbers. I'm going to save the page. I'll go back to my web browser and refresh it. And you'll notice that we've got companies, and we also have contacts now. The relationship's handled for you. You don't have to query the contacts, too. It just happens automatically. So as I click on companies, we get the contacts for the companies. It really is that easy which is pretty fantastic. Now, we can edit, of course, too. This widget supports editing. Before I do that, though, let me show you something back in 4D. This 4D application, it was created relatively recently. But we do have some code in it, right? We have some, some expertise inside the system. And <laughs> well, not exactly. We have one little trigger. And all this trigger does is says, if a first name has a number in it, throw an error. Don't let the save happen. So this is business logic that's in 4D. Let's see how Wakanda handles that. So I'll just go ahead and go and, oh, look, there's Lyle. That's me. I'll go ahead and put my, a number at the end of my name. That's not OK. And I'll click out of there. I didn't have to do anything, and I'm already getting Wakanda throwing an error message because 4D said no, business logic says no. Of course, in Wakanda, for an end user, I'd want to make this a little cleaner. But the point is that your existing 4D code, business logic, is used. It's not ignoring that. It's using that. I, I was about to create a form and all that as well, like an input form. Um, but we are really tight on time. And we have some great uh, classes and breakout sessions that I'll mention in a little bit. So we'll move on from this point and go back to slides.
So <clears throat> at this point, you're going, cool, I want to get my hands on that and play, because you're a developer, and that's what we like to do. And then you might be thinking, wow, that sounds like a lot of work to redo my application I've been writing for 20 years. Yikes. But really what you have to ask is, what do you need to build? Do you really need to build your entire application? So the question kind of translates to, what should be mobile? What part of your application? And of course, you're the best one to answer that. What should be mobile? So just think about the workforce for a second and what it really means. Mobility means flexibility, right? You have a flexible workforce, and therefore, well, truth be told, the employee will work more. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a mean thing to say, but because I have my mobile, my mobile devices, I am more connected to people that I work with, right? I'm checking email all the time. I'm doing stuff on the go. If your application also has that feature, you have an ability to service your client more. So the flexibility empowers the user to potentially work in different ways. And all you need to do in your application is support those different ways. And I want to urge you, when you think about how to update your, database, your system, your 40 database, into the mobile space, do not rebuild it. That's not what we're talking about. Because rebuilding it in a web client space, I've seen some 40 applications, and those would be daunting in a web environment. It's a little more difficult in a web environment. Wakanda makes it a lot easier. 40 mobile solution for you is the way to go. But you're not trying to rebuild the entire thing. Instead, when one of your clients asked you for a report, you added reporting, right? 40 applications regularly have reporting. You didn't make a report for every single screen because they're different things. You added a feature. So think about 40 Mobile as an enhancement to your current applications. You're adding the feature of mobility. You're adding the feature of flexibility. You are not rebuilding your application. Now it starts to get more interesting. Because now you don't go, oh, all that work. You go, oh, what could I enhance my application to do that would make it better for my users? They're asking for mobile. Of course we know it needs to be mobile. But what in my application would make sense to be mobile? Well, let's take a look. I'll open the iPad. Thank you, Ad. So, this um, iPad, it's an iPad 2, and um, it's running iOS 7, OK? So I've gotten the most recent update of the application as a URL in an email, OK? So I'm going to open Safari, the web browser, and I'm just going to paste it into the menu bar and run it. Now, what this has just done is connected to Wakanda server on Ads Machine. Wakanda server is connected to 4D server, and the data you're seeing is from 4D. Okay? And I'll, I'll prove that to you in a minute. Um, but notice that right now, this web application has a, a menu bar at the top that looks like a browser. That's taking up space, and it's not necessary. So there's easy ways to solve that. I'm simply going to add it to the home screen. See that button right there I'm depressing? Add to home screen. That's the name of, the name of it. We'll say add. Closes the browser. Now shows an icon, just like an application, just like a native application. But that's actually a web application. So now I'll launch it again. And now we see the same application, but there's no bar at the top. Right? It's a complete screen app. Feels very much like a native application. All right. So I'm at a conference, let's say, I don't know, in Paris. And um, one of the clients of the company I work for bought me a drink. Hint, hint. So um, let me say that while I was kind of engaged in conversation, they said they worked for 4D. OK, 4D, who is this person? Is this Ken or Ken? Uh, anyway, let me just capture that in my 4D application. So I'll make a new company, and I'll just call it, uh, we'll call it 4D Summit, since we're at 4D Summit. And I'll go ahead and save this. I, I got called off to another drink somewhere. So that night I went out and did other things, and I'm, I'm done. 
with the application for right now. In fact, I had to look up a map and stuff to find out how to get to my hotel. So now, let's go ahead and look at, back at the office in San Jose, Ad comes in the next morning, and he gets a weird call from me at night that says, um, I met somebody from that 4D Summit company. His name's Ken or Kevin or something, but we th I think we have him on paper files because he was a customer long ago. So Ad, back in the 4D application, is working at a desktop computer. He's got the power, well, a laptop actually, a laptop, he's got a full keyboard. Behind him is a file cabinet with a whole bunch of paperwork in it. He pulls out the paperwork, he's at work. He's in the right environment to do what he's about to do. He's gonna do some research on a client. So he'll go take a look at the leads that came in, my leads right there, and opens that up, goes, pulls a file, and finds out who this person was, and starts adding that to this record. What is the person's name? Well, I don't know yet because I'm drinking at a bar somewhere. Okay. So he's doing the work that you do at the office. And eventually he'll save this. Good? Saved? All right. Later on, I pull up my iPad and I have a few minutes between sessions. And I see that person drinking coffee. Kevin, Kent, Ken, something like that. I'm like, oh, who was that guy? So I go back to the application and I run it and connect up to the server. By the way, if Ad had pushed a new version of this application, I'd be getting the new version, right? Every time I go, I get the new version. So now all I gotta do is search for the summit, right, 4D summit. There's 4D summit, I click on it. And down there, right there, is Kevin. Or Ken, Ken, oh good, I finally figured it out. That right there is enhancing your app with 4D Mobile, okay?